For decades, military bases have reported unidentified craft penetrating the most restricted airspace. Is it the Soviets or is it something else? Are these unidentified flying objects examples of advanced spy technology? You've got this apparent interest in our technology. Or is there another, otherworldly explanation? Was this a weapon? Was this a warning? What was this? These are some of the most extraordinary UFO encounters in history. Oh, I'm sorry, what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. At U.S. Air Force bases, on the front lines of the Cold War. Damn it, what they plan at? Stop, 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 stop. If unidentified flying objects are infiltrating top secret facilities, should the world be put on red alert? Unidentified flying objects have been seen in our skies for decades. Thousands of UFO sightings have been documented in official government files. Most have logical, scientific explanations. Yet some cases remain unexplained, classified, unidentified. Can newly released files reveal the truth behind these UFO encounters? Christmas night, 1980. Security personnel on a NATO Air Force base notice something is wrong. 160 kilometers northeast of London, two Royal Air Force bases sit side by side, Woodbridge and Bentwaters. They are separated by a wooded area known as Rendlesham Forest. During the Cold War, the British bases are operated by the U.S. Air Force. Airman First Class John Burroughs and Sergeant Bud Steffens are patrolmen of the United States Air Force Police. They have one objective, protect the base. Sergeant Steffens, who was driving the vehicle, noticed some strange lights in the forest. Burroughs has been stationed on the base for a year and a half. He's never seen anything like it. There were strange, like, white lights. The two patrolmen head outside of the base into the adjoining forest to investigate. When Burroughs gets out of the car, he immediately notices something unusual. There was like a static electricity in the air. Something just didn't feel right. He says, yeah, let's get out of here. Let's get back up to the gate. Burroughs and Steffens head back to the base. They need authorization before they can investigate further. I jumped out, went into the gate shack and picked up the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, Shift to... commander got confirmation that something was over the area that disappeared off a radar. RAF Bentwater's law enforcement desk alerts the Suffolk police that soldiers are investigating the possible UFO. This is the first link in a chain of documents in what will be considered one of the most significant UFO sightings on record. Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston and Airman Edward Cabanese are assigned to join Burroughs. Their orders investigate unidentified lights in Rendlesham Forest. As we were driving down, we could still see the light in the forest. We eventually got to the point where the truck couldn't go any further and we stopped. Stop, 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 stop. We dismounted the vehicle, the three of us. We followed the lights into the forest. So the adrenaline was pumping and we just spread out. More than 30 years later, John Burroughs retraces his steps in Rendlesham Forest. This is where Sergeant Pennison and myself and Airman Kambanzak were. It seemed like some points it got closer to us and we were going to get on top of it. And then when you got to the area where you thought it was, it wasn't there. The three men approach the light in the forest. We came up over the burn. As they come towards a clearing, all of a sudden, there it was. This whole area, this whole area was just lit up almost like daylight. And then that's when we hit the ground. Now we're looking at it. It just seemed like whatever it was kind of consolidated and went up. It just seemed to dim to me and then go up. And it shot back out towards the coast. 
Burroughs, Peniston, and Cabanasag don't know what they have just seen, but an investigation is about to begin. Early the next morning, base personnel and local police locate the area where an unidentified craft possibly landed. They comb the scene and discover three strange indentations in the soil. In the early 1990s, Nick Pope worked for the UK Ministry of Defense's UFO Investigation Unit. During my time on the Ministry of Defense's UFO project, it was clear to me that the Rendlesham Forest incident was Britain's most significant and compelling UFO case. While with the MOD, he investigates the Rendlesham files. The three indentations, when plotted out, formed a triangle shape. There was physical evidence some object had uh, somehow maneuvered into that small clearing. What is this object? Is it the Soviets or is it something else? It's 1980. In the skies over Europe, the Cold War is heating up. The world is divided between two nuclear superpowers. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly... Now, newly elected U.S. President Ronald Reagan has vowed to stand up to the Soviet Union. And on the English North Sea coast, the twin bases Woodbridge and Bentwaters are within striking distance if the Soviets invade Western allies. Less than a week after their harrowing experience, Burroughs, Peniston, and Cabanaseg are required to write statements. Detailed witness statements were taken from the key participants. These once top secret documents held in the U.S. Air Force archives are actual first person accounts of the events that happened that night. Those statements were declassified and obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. So we have in the files and in the other related documentation a verifiable audit trail of papers, United States Air Force documents actually backing up the stories that the witnesses tell. Sergeant Peniston's statement includes a striking observation. The object, he writes, is definitely mechanical in nature. But if it is mechanical, then who built it? Could this have been uh, classified U.S. technology in one way or another? Author and UFO researcher Richard Dolan has studied the case in depth. Could it have been a falling satellite, like some people have said? No, I don't think it could at all have been a falling satellite. At all. How does that explain what happened in the forest? The Russians? No, not really. I mean, there's just no evidence. There's no reason to think that this was Russian technology. Could the mysterious events at the Twin Bases be somehow linked to their strategic role in a Cold War confrontation? There have been a number of allegations over the years that nuclear weapons were kept at Bentwaters and or Woodbridge. It's the long-standing policy of the British government not to comment on this and neither to confirm nor deny the presence of nuclear weapons at any specific location at any particular time. Are nuclear weapons stored at Bentwaters and Woodbridge bases? The British and US governments have refused to comment. But if there is a connection between nuclear weapons and unidentified flying objects, this story is about to get even stranger. We got lights over Rendlesham Forest. For two more nights, the strange lights return to the twin bases. No documentation for the second night sighting has ever surfaced, but the third night is different. This time, senior officers are involved. Deputy Base Commander Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt is a first-hand witness. He decided to go to the clearing where Burroughs and Peniston had had their encounter on the first night. Halt's intention is to defuse this whole situation. Rumors about the UFO sightings have been sweeping the base. So Halt wants to go out here 
and debunk this whole UFO nonsense. What happens next is one of the best documented reports of an unidentified flying object in history. Colonel Holt habitually carried with him a small handheld cassette recorder. 150 feet or more from the initial, I should say, suspected impact point. There is no question whatsoever about the authenticity of this tape. Are we on the scale? Yes, sir. We're now on the 510 scale. Colonel Holt and all the other witnesses uh, recalled making it. Look at that spot number one today. Starlight scope. This audio tape is a key piece of evidence and documents exactly what Holt and the other men saw. This is strange. Here, someone want to look at the spots on the ground? Holt's team has come equipped with Geiger counters to detect anomalous radiation levels. They find that the radiation readings peak in the three indentations where the UFO landed on the first night. An abrasion or something in the ground where the pine needles are all pushed back while we get a high uh, reading. So there's positive after effect? Yes, there is definitely. There seem to be burn marks, scorch marks on the sides of some of the trees around the clearing. Getting a definite heat reflection off the tree about, about three to four feet off the ground. Hey, this is eerie. There are these, these peaks in radiation levels in the three indentations and on the faces of the, the trees. And at that point, it becomes a reality for Holt because somebody calls out, sir, it's back, look there, through the trees. Right at this position here. Oh, hey, I see it too. What is it? That's a strange, small red light. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. Yeah, yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it too. Weird. Let's move out to the edge of the clearing so we can get a better look at it. Holt's team moves forward. They really don't know what to make of this thing. Yeah, we're heading about 110 to 120 degrees from the side on through to the clearing now. Still getting a reading on the meter. About two clicks. There's a point where they realize it's actually coming closer. And it's like, it's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. You listen to that tape, you can hear the tension and the fear in those men's voices. Okay, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. They look back at the direction they've come and directly, it seems, over the base itself is one of the UFOs. And it's firing beams of light down at an area later identified as the weapon storage area. Was this a communication? Was this a weapon? Was this a warning? What was this? It's not the first time. Five years before the incident at Rendlesham Forest, a U.S. Air Force base has a similar encounter. So it's late October 1975. It's late at night. You're at Loring Air Force Base, northern Maine, and an unknown something is being tracked coming toward the base. Loring is a strategic command Air Force base for nuclear-armed aircraft guarding against Russian aggression. Unidentified aircraft who are flying in restricted airspace. A report from that night states that the unidentified object was at an altitude of 150 feet and was sighted near the weapons storage area. Damn it, what did they plan that? Eyewitnesses describe the craft as a helicopter. Identify yourself, over. But when a National Guard helicopter attempts to intercept, the pilot cannot see the intruder. For two hours, the craft is seen over the base and weapons storage area. Then, it disappears into the night. The similarities between the Rendlesham Forest incident and the incident at Loring Air Force Base five years previously are intriguing. Here is a UFO not only penetrating our sophisticated air defense network, but then hovering directly overhead the weapon storage area. Loring was important because there was nuclear ordnance stored there. It happens again the next night at the exact same time. So you've got this case where this something comes in, 
It hangs out for a certain period of time and then it goes away. And again, this is a pattern. The same pattern is seen at Rendlesham. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. You've got this apparent interest by whoever is behind this phenomenon in our technology. It is staggering to envisage a situation where a UFO operates with impunity over a sensitive military establishment and this isn't cause for concern at extremely senior level. There is definite concern over what is flying near Bentwaters and Woodbridge. What it is remains unknown. Could it be a threat to the military bases? The third night of sightings, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Halt is at the center of one of the best documented UFO sightings in history. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. The Air Force cordons off the forest to military personnel only. Off duty patrolman John Burroughs, who witnessed the first night's events, rushes to the scene. Myself and one other airman were allowed to proceed forward out into the field and meet up with Colonel Halt's party. Halt and his men are on their way back to base to report what they've seen. When I met up with Colonel Halt, he turned and pointed out towards what had been Bentwater's base. And at that point, I could see a blue light which appeared to be flying around in the sky. With Halt's permission, Burroughs and Sergeant Adrian Bastinza move forward. And to be able to get out there and get close to something again was just, you, you just didn't know what to make of it. You didn't know what it could be or why it would be back. As the two men moved toward the object, Sergeant Bastinza falls to the ground. He felt something actually pushed him down to the ground and held him to the ground. I looked up and it appeared like the object was almost on top of us at that point. Burroughs is mesmerized by the intense light. Everything seemed like we were in slow motion. And the next thing I know, the object was gone. For John Burroughs, what happens next is a total mystery. I have no memory from how I got back from the field all the way up till Sunday night, which would have been about 14 hours where I don't remember how I got home, where I was. Days later, Colonel Halt summons Burroughs, Penniston, and Cabanasag to his office to file their reports. When we were asked to write the report, I was told just to write a, a brief summary on the first night while we went out there. Seeming to break military protocol, Airman Burroughs is told not to include the events of night three in his statement. I can only speculate that because of the fact that Sergeant Bastens and I got close to it, maybe they didn't want that part included. Colonel Holt wanted this whole situation to go away. He wanted to forget the whole thing and put it behind him. Holt describes this whole subject as being not career enhancing. As the officer in charge, Holt has no choice. Two weeks after night three, he writes a detailed report on the UFO sightings. It is the only official document from the third and final evening of the Rendlesham Forest incident. The Holt memo is entitled Unexplained Lights, but clearly goes on to describe something which goes uh, over and above just lights in the sky. The low key title is I think a deliberate attempt already at the outset to try and downplay this incident. But of course Holt's report makes it perfectly clear. This wasn't unexplained lights. This was a landed metallic craft. Others believe the source of the lights was more down to earth. My feeling is that their original source of the UFO was the Orford Nest Lighthouse. Tim Printy is a retired US Navy submariner, UFO researcher, and skeptic. The lighthouse was in the direction that the airmen went. The Orford Lighthouse is located six miles directly east of Rendlesham Forest. They went out the east gate, they went into the woods, they ended up in a field. In that field, you can see the Orford Lighthouse out in the distance. Police documents back Printy's hypothesis. During their investigation, 
they state the only lights visible to the attending officers were those visible from the Orford Lighthouse. And even further, Printy believes that the halt tape is evidence they saw the light from the lighthouse and nothing more. On the tape that Colonel Halt made, you can get a time sequence on there. And it's every five seconds, that's the same rotation rate in which the lighthouse at Orford Ness flashes its light. There is a short segment of the halt tape that does seem to line up to the interval Printy suggests. Straight ahead, but between the two, there it is again. Watch, straight ahead off my flash right there. Now, there, there it is. Hey, I see it too. Could the men from the base have mistaken the Orford Lighthouse as some unidentified object? Nick Pope doesn't believe so. There are a number of skeptical theories about Rendlesham Forest, but I looked at these as part of my cold case review at the Ministry of Defence, and they hold no water. I've been to Rendlesham Forest on numerous occasions. For most of the places where the witnesses actually saw the UFO, the beam from the lighthouse isn't even visible. Unfortunately, the Orford Lighthouse is now decommissioned, so no further analysis can be done. Even if the lights seen by Halt and Burroughs came from the lighthouse, it cannot explain the bizarre experiences of other eyewitnesses. Larry Warren is one of the most controversial figures in the Rendlesham story. He was an Air Force security specialist at the time of the UFO event. On the night in question, I was involved. That is the night Charles Holt made his audio tape. I was not with Charles Holt's party. I've never claimed to be. Larry Warren has returned to Bentwaters Air Force Base for the first time in over 30 years. His account of what happened on the third night goes far beyond anything Burroughs and Holt has said so far. We're at the end of the Bentwaters runway. Night three, Warren is on guard at the end of the Bentwaters runway. We got lights over Rendlesham Forest. I get a call from Central Security Control saying, uh, reactivate your post, Lieutenant England is gonna be pulling up to your post. So within 10 minutes, I had three other individuals in the back of the security police truck. Warren realizes they are driving into Rendlesham Forest towards the east gate of Woodbridge Base. That's where everything, you know, took a turn for me. Warren arrives at Operations Base Camp. He's ordered immediately to investigate the forest. I saw lights at a distance. At first, nothing seems out of the ordinary. Everything was normal. I thought it was an exercise, a training exercise. But it got weird and it got strange. Larry Warren's story will take a shocking turn with something beyond our world. December 28th, 1980, the third night of UFO sightings. U.S. Air Force Security Specialist Larry Warren is cautiously making his way through the Rendlesham Forest, not far from where the original Night One event took place. This is the middle of the night now. Two nights after the initial contact. Warren and the security detail are directed to a clearing in the woods. There was a massive uh, static electric charge in the forest. You can feel the hair on your arms. It was an energy thing that was all over you. Warren claims to have entered the clearing. In this field was a mist on the ground. It was 50 foot in diameter. It wasn't hovering above it. It was like a fog. His recollections go beyond anyone else's reports. The cameras now would be behind me off to the right, right over here, filming this thing, this glowing fog, because that was the axis where the commanders came in, right over here. Above that stand of trees, a red light appeared. And this red light came in and it did a downward arc over this field. 20 feet above this mist on the ground and detonated. It exploded right instantly. And it flashed so bright that it was, uh, there was a moment of blindness. Larry's story takes a dramatic and shocking twist. There was this 
uh, thing. And it was very dreamlike, and, but it had definitely a delta shapes to it, and it had a defined thing that kept masking itself right in front of us. No windows, no nothing. It was just, you couldn't, it just kept changing. This thing like red, but not really red, and blue at the base. What Larry Warren says happens next makes this strange story even stranger. And then suddenly in front of us, in front of me, from the right side of it, moved this light three feet off the ground, bluish golden color, and it split into three lights over here. And as that light faded, within that light was three well, uh, beings. They certainly didn't look like you and I. And it was small and about this high off the ground. It was some translucent kind of thing with what looked like heads and faces. All this happened right there, all of it. And they plant cowards here now. Larry Warren is convinced he saw some type of unknown life form that night in Rendlesham Forest. Larry says that not only did he see the UFO, but he saw what might have been some sort of uh, meeting between one of the senior officers in the US Air Force and possibly some uh, extraterrestrial. And there were some base command who deny any involvement, but they were there. And then I was tapped out on the shoulder, head back to the vehicles. Got the bus back to the main site on Bent Waters. Then, Specialist Larry Warren does what any 19-year-old would do. Trump call to the United States of America. I'm calling my mother. I want her to know about this thing. And uh, I said, Ma, you won't believe uh, a UFO landed near the base. I saw it, and I just kept talking. And she wasn't there anymore. Hung up. I called the operator back. She said, are you calling from the base? And I said, yes. And she goes, you were cut off on the base. And I went, oh, you know what? I knew there's something wrong. That night changed my life forever. I was one way when I got here. I was a total different person when I left this field. No document verifies Warren's strange and remarkable account of night three. It's a story that remains controversial and unproven. But the files that do exist leave a trail of evidence. Nick Pope believes that there could have been a cover-up despite the government's insistence that the UFO sighting was nothing of defense significance. This is an intriguing aspect of this case because on the one hand, the position of the US government is that UFOs are no longer of any interest, but here you have clearly a detailed investigation into UFOs but the most senior United States Air Force officer in Europe personally flew in to be briefed about this. In a declassified memo dated February 16th, 1981, a senior RAF officer stated that General Charles Gabriel, Commander-in-Chief of the United States Air Force in Europe, flew into Bentwaters. The fact that General Gabriel visited the base and was briefed on this incident shows that this was taken seriously at the very highest levels within the US military. One of the Ministry of Defense documents references General Gabriel's visit. Gabriel was briefed, was given items such as Colonel Holt's tape recording, and then took them back to Germany. There are unanswered questions here. What other material did General Gabriel take back to his headquarters. We know from Colonel Holt's tape and from testimony of those witnesses involved that soil samples were taken, that sap and bark samples from the trees that had been damaged. All this material has disappeared. That, to me, is absolutely extraordinary and quite without precedent. General Gabriel 
but had a perfectly rational reason for being on base. Tim Printy has an opposing theory. There may have been a concern on his part as to his personnel actually going out into British territory on unauthorized visits in uh, uniform. People are going to be concerned about that. Why is the US military walking around in my backyard? If there is a cover-up, one man is credited for pulling back the curtain. Larry Warren remains a provocative character, not just for his claims about UFOs, but for the alleged debriefing that followed. Um, they showed this movie, I, you know, just unnarrated gun camera footage of objects and things. He says it begins with a screening that seems innocent enough. And in the room were two guys who identified themselves as Armed Forces Security Services, which are a field arm of the NSA. You'll never understand what you've seen. This is the need for secrecy. This is the need not to talk about it on the base. See, all this for me starts the next night. Not even that thing in the woods, whatever. The next night, that's where it showed its teeth. And it was ugly, man. He can only remember what happens next in fragments. But the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Larry Warren's recollection of a UFO encounter on the third night of the Rendlesham Forest sightings is like something out of a science fiction story. But his allegations go further. Warren believes that the U.S. government employed aggressive interrogation techniques to brainwash and reprogram memories at Bentwaters base in 1980. I have memories now that are getting clearer of being in a very clinical situation, being hooked up to uh, IV, military and other guys talking to me. I can see it. You were never in the field disjointed, broken images of a very strange facility. That's where they can fill you with all kinds of stuff and play with you. They had about two days to play with me. Did the U.S. government ever use these types of interrogation techniques? Project MKUltra was a secret mind control operation created by the Central Intelligence Agency in the 1950s and then officially shut down in 1973. MKUltra was a CIA program to see whether techniques such as drugs and hypnosis could be used to influence people, to change their behavior, um, to create false memories, and perhaps to wipe away real memories. There was definitely a combination of hypnosis, drugs, and influence drugs, and threats to listen, you know, really distort or build walls or false images. If true, Larry's experience resembles the objectives of MK Ultra experiments. Back in 1980, at the time of the Rendlesham Forest incident, these techniques, drugs, hypnosis, etc were apparently still being used. Are these merely the false memories of an excitable young airman? Were others exposed to similar treatment? Could this be the reason John Burroughs lost 14 hours of memory after his last sighting of the UFO? I don't know why I can't remember. That was one of the things that bothered me. There's certain things you can remember distinctly, and then there's other things like, I remember how I got home the first day, but I don't remember what happened to me after being out there on the third night other than starting to walk back. Airmen like Burroughs and Warren were rank and file. But what about the officer in command on the third night? Nick Pope interviewed Charles Holt on this subject. Holt felt strongly that something unexplained had happened that night. Colonel Holt felt extremely angry and frustrated by the way in which unmarked aircraft were flying in, personnel who nobody knew were interviewing and in some cases aggressively interrogating the witnesses. I'm going to tell you what happened. You interview a witness, but you don't threaten them, you don't drug them, you don't hypnotize them. I was a pretty damaged and confused kid at that point. Warren writes home. It is the only document he has to back up his claims. 
I wrote, my, I'll tell you the truth of the UFO when I get home. I can't in the mail. They read it. But questions remain about Larry Warren's experiences that night in the field and his alleged interrogation. There seems to be no official document trail. One of the problems with Larry's story is, is really the fact that there are few, if any, other witnesses who place him out there at the time. Whether this means that Larry's story is not true, or whether it simply means that Larry was, was witnessing other things that people like Holt and Burroughs and Peniston just weren't involved with, I don't know. Larry Warren's story had little support until 2010. One document does back up his claim of extraterrestrial visitation. June 17, 2010, Colonel Charles Holt, the highest ranking officer to go on the record about the UFO experience at Rendlesham, signs a notarized affidavit detailing his sworn account of events on the third night. Halt states that he believes the objects he sees are extraterrestrial in origin. Well, I'm observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. But Halt's affidavit goes further by raising another controversial question. Were there nuclear weapons at RAF Bentwaters? Halt states he can neither confirm nor deny that the weapons storage area held nuclear weapons. Not even Nick Pope can speak openly. I served for 21 years in the Ministry of Defense, and I signed the Official Secrets Act on my very first day. It binds me for life. I must neither confirm nor deny any of the stories and rumors about nuclear weapons here. But Larry Warren will say what others will not. Aria Bentwaters in Woodbridge was a frontline base in the Cold War. Uh, it was a first strike option for the Russians, and uh, we knew it. We're at the uh, entrance uh, to Hot Row, right here. And it's called a Hot Row because of radiac material and the ordinance, nuclear ordinance. So it's hot nuke. Frankly, no one would talk about the nukes here on the base or anything. Larry Warren says he is told about the presence of nuclear weapons while training on Hot Row. I worked in here one night as a shadow for a cop, and I had a lot explained to me about what was here. We had a huge backline storage of tactical nuclear weapons. Can what Larry Warren says be believed? Documents obtained from the US-based Environmental Watchdog Natural Resources Defense Council back up his claim that there were nuclear weapons at Bentwaters. The documents say that until 1986, RAF Bentwaters was a storage facility for nuclear bombs with a capacity of 100 nuclear warheads. Despite the government's neither confirm nor deny stance on the nuclear rumors, Lord Hill Norton, a former chief of the defense staff and a five-star admiral, has been rather more outspoken. In 1997, Hill Norton writes a letter to the Minister of State for Defense, asking for an investigation into Colonel Halt's claims. In that letter, he refers to RAF Bentwaters as nuclear armed. Ministers, and the Ministry of Defense in particular, saying that nothing that took place that December night in Suffolk is of defense interest. It simply isn't true. The thing that makes Rendlesham really delicate from the uh, UK point of view is that, yeah, nukes were there, but nukes were not supposed to be there. The possible presence of nuclear armaments at Bentwaters may have breached treaty obligations between the US and the UK. They lied to the people. They said, we don't have nukes here, and they did have nukes there. And in December 1980, they may have been ready to use them. We're in the War Operations Center at Bentwaters. In the event of a nuclear war or incident, this room would have played a key role. December 1980 was undoubtedly one of the hottest moments in the Cold War. There is a spirit of solidarity abroad in the world tonight that no physical force can crush. The political crisis in Eastern Europe 
is threatening the balance of power in the Cold War. The world is nearing red alert. Woodbridge and Bentwaters were a forward nuclear base for NATO at that time. So if anything went down in terms of war, that base would have been a key strategic base involved in that. What was it that flew over RAF Bentwaters? And more importantly, why was it there? Is there a connection between those sightings at Bentwaters and those over nuclear bases in the United States? Over four decades, unidentified flying objects have been sighted in proximity to sensitive nuclear facilities in the United States and the United Kingdom. As early as 1948, unidentified flying objects were seen over the atomic research labs in Los Alamos. In 1975, at Loring Air Force Base in Maine, over two nights, unexplained craft are observed above the weapons storage area. The documented evidence is clear. Across the United States, official reports of unexplained sightings at American nuclear bases. But the most compelling and best documented incident is the one in the UK's Rendlesham Forest in December of 1980. Here, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. The thing about the Rendlesham case is that it's, it's been looked at for years and years and years as a UFO story. And it's a great, fascinating UFO story. but. I think it's important to keep in mind that this is a UFO nuke story. That's a key connection to this whole uh, event, that it's the nuclear connection. My first thought was that this must be some sort of secret prototype aircraft or drone. I'd really looked at this idea of secret spy planes and drones simply because the alternatives were, were, were just too far out. Colonel Charles Halt's affidavit clearly states he believes the objects he saw over RAF Bentwaters were extraterrestrial in origin. Richard Dolan has a compelling theory why Halt may be right. Why would hypothetical aliens be interested in our nuclear technology to begin with? Nuclear technology really can destroy the entire Earth like that. During the 1950s and 1960s and 70s, this planet was subject to over 2,000 detonations of nuclear devices. Three nights of sightings, two of them thoroughly documented, indicate that some kind of craft arrived at a moment of historic tension on the front lines of the Cold War. Look, if you're an intelligence that's monitoring the Earth and you're seeing the native species blow up one nuclear bomb after another, after another, after another in these tests all over the planet, you might find it interesting and you might even be a little bit concerned about what these these natives are doing. Tim Printy has doubts. The energy released in a nuclear explosion, while very devastating locally, is relatively insignificant when you're observing from space. If you're on the moon, you probably wouldn't even notice. Radiation falls off with distance. In other words, the further you are away, the fainter it gets. Many scientists have pointed out that the power of nuclear weapons would be trivial to an alien species that has mastered faster than light space travel. Yet the official files and documents reveal that something bizarre appeared over Bentwaters and Woodbridge air bases in 1980. Was it war jitters, spy technology, a cover-up of a nuclear base, or something even stranger? Official files and documents show Supporting evidence of nuclear weapons at RAF Bentwaters. Supporting evidence of UFOs near both bases. No conclusive evidence that the object is of alien origin. Case study, Rendlesham Forest incident, remains unidentified. Could it have been extraterrestrial? I can't rule that out. But when you've eliminated all the other possibilities, uh, there are a few other places you can go. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. Next week, the so-called Battle of L.A. It's back to 1942 when UFOs Declassified continues Thursday at 10. If you missed the first episode of our exclusive new series, catch up now with UK TV Play. Up next tonight, The World at War.